Hey, everyone. Welcome to DeFi's. It is James and Shanith. It's January hey, hey. 4th uh, today, and I hope everyone had a happy and healthy holidays uh, and a new year. You know, hope everyone is staying safe. We know Omicron is uh, surging. It's crazy in the city right now, um, but hope everyone is, you know, faring a little bit better, um, you know, with everything going on. But regardless, we're super excited for, you know, today's episode. And, you know, to start out the new year, one of the things that we've talked about, you know, a lot over the past, you know, uh, let's say however many podcasts we've done, I know we're over 10 now, is, you know, how, how are we approaching, you know, crypto? You know, what do we think about the different use cases? But one of the areas that we've touched on and we touched on a little bit in the beginning is a big part of why we started this podcast is just the general interest in Web3 and how, you know, whatever we do in the future, venture-wise, investment-wise, it's very much a part of our portfolio and our vision. Um, and that's where we want to start out the new year, which is talking about some Web3 use cases. And Web3 is that buzzword that everyone's been talking about. And I hate using buzzwords, but unfortunately, that's where uh, we have to go. But before we jump into anything and go into the details, as always, please, please, please uh, make sure that you subscribe to our podcast via Spotify, uh, via Apple Music, YouTube, as well as subscribe to our newsletter. We will definitely have more content coming, including more podcasts. Um, and I'm really excited for this year. And you know, uh, one of the reasons why and is I was looking at a recap and, you know, Shanif, and one of the things that I was looking at this recap, it was you know, looking at VC funding in Web3. Mm. Um, and that's why, you know, we're talking, I keep saying Web3, Web3, buzzword, anything VC, yep. buzzword, AI, <laughs> everything down those lines. But the, the magnitude of the change was, was very, very large. It was sitting around, I think last year, 2021, $21 uh, billion was invested in, in Web3 oh. startups. And it, it was up, I have to look at the numbers again, I'd have to dig it up, but that's a very large amount of money. It's very small in the, in the realm of, you know, I think you, you have, you know, you're seeing software companies that are raising just $2 billion. I think Gong uh, or sales off, someone got a $2 billion investment to build out the revenue intelligence technology. But $21 billion, that's not a, no fad anymore, in my opinion, at least. Yeah. Uh, and this is money coming from A16Z. It isn't just these like hyper-focused uh, crypto investments anymore. It's very much, you know, in mainstream uh, Sand Hill Lane. Um, I think that's what it's called. <laughs> out Sand in Hill South. Road, maybe. Sand Hill Road. So I, I did a did a talk down to them calling it Lane, but <laughs> that's in, in my opinion. This is something I've been talking to Shanif about. Is you know. Uh, Morris Law and, and all this pack. And you know, one of the, the learnings was uh, crossing the chasm of, you know, when a technology is, you know, kind of getting ready for that that scaling period where it's it's a certainty that it'll happen. It's not like if, it's when. Um, and it's no longer, I, I guess, at risk of going to funk or going to zero. There's obviously always going to be tokens that go to zero. Uh, but I think this, this centralized world is here to stay. So, you know, we thought uh, it would be great to just start off the year looking at or, or just talking about a couple of use cases and, and just diving into some of the ones that we're really excited about. Because interestingly enough, Shanif and I are very interested in, um, you know, a lot of different things in Web3, uh, but we've also become hyper-focused or hyper-interested in different areas of Web3. And one of the areas that Shanif has been really interested in is in DAOs, while I have kind of taken the NFT and uh, play to earn blockchain route, and we both love DeFi, obviously, because, you know, it's it's beautiful in and of itself, but you know, Shanif sent me this article today and uh, I didn't, I, I wouldn't be able to do the justice to be able to explain it, uh, but I know it got Shanif pretty excited and, you know, Shanif, yeah. DAOs are, you know, a way that we can, sh we can really just be more efficient in general. It could change every, anything because really it all it is, is a decentralized governance group instead of having, you know, let's say hierarchies, um, it's, it's self-governed, which, you know, could, it could be interesting because yeah. you, you can apply that to equities in a way. Um, because a token holder is very similar to a shareholder and each token holder has a certain number of votes based on the number of tokens they have. So it's very interesting to do with shares. And that would allow more people to sit at the table um, versus, you know, the, the same 10 funds like Vanguard, BlackRock, mm. you know, all the index providers who they say they don't, you know, push their way. And, and this is a completely different use case. I'm ranting now, but DAOs are exciting because it could really, you know, help, you know, change the way that everyone interacts. But Ashif, well, tell us a little bit about that article, yeah. why you were so excited about it. Yeah, so DAOs are really exciting to me, mostly because I can see their impact and potential to change uh, human society, like 
you know, flat out, I think they have the potential to change how people work and organize. The article, uh, and for those of you who haven't heard it yet, we did a DAO, we did a podcast on DAOs a couple of weeks ago or a couple of months ago. I don't I don't even remember at this point. Go check it out because we'll we'll talk through the basics of the yeah. of DAOs in that podcast. But this article that I saw today, um, it's it was from a it was from DAO House, which is I think right now the leader in sort of helping people set up their own decentralized autonomous DAO, organizations. DAO is a service, it sounds like. DAO is a service, exactly. And I actually think there's a huge amount of potential there. If you believe, like I do, that the world is really moving to the world, the world is moving to a paradigm of decentralization where organizations are going to be created kind of much more informally going forward. Even if those organizations provide an economic stake to their to their stakeholders, you don't necessarily need to have these sort of incorporated companies now like you've had for the past couple of hundred years. Um, but one of there's a lot of issues around organizing and managing a DAO, especially one that has an economic sort of uh, aspect to it. So this article specifically talked about how uh, there's a new model, a new sort of governance paradigm coming out for people who contribute capital into an organization and how that capital can be used and how governance of that capital uh, should proceed within a DAO. So they kind of gave a really good example where let's say you produce, let's say you're a funder for some sort of project. Um, classic example is let's say you're a VC who's funding a startup. Once you provide the startup capital to the company, you no longer control that money. You don't have any say really in how that VC and how that startup uses that capital. I mean, sure, you may be on the board, or you know, maybe maybe you have some pull over the founders, but really the founders are are the ones who are deciding what to do with that cash. It's all well and good. But um, you know what happens if you're maybe a large, like a much more decentralized organization where you're allocating funds for different projects, kind of like what we talked about in, in the DAO podcast. Uh, for example, in a charity, maybe you're a charity that has 10 different projects and you need to fund these projects, right? As a DAO, what you now have the ability to do is set up specific DAOs for these projects, um, either independently or under an umbrella. And you as a funder, can now have a say in how the funds uh, will be used by the DAO to execute on that project. So you're, you might be saying, well, I can already do that. What's different? So the thing that's different today uh, or going forward is if you're a funder of a DAO, you can actually control um, your economic stake, how much you've uh, funded into the DAO through the point of actually um, giving the funding and actually through the point of how those funds are, are gonna be used. So for example, let's say that the, the DAO charity decides to do something you don't like. You have the ability as a DAO funder to take back your funds and say, look, I don't agree with this. I haven't, you know, I haven't voted for this, or maybe I voted for this and I was in the majority and I said, look, I don't think we should be using our funds this way. So funds can be recalled and then the organization can no longer use those funds. So this particular email, and it's a very, very, long but fascinating read. It's basically arguing uh, or, or proposing a new sort of governance model for people who fund DAOs and saying you now have more control over how your funding, how your funds will be used um, to the point where you no longer have to sit back and say, look, I'm just going to be an observer and I'll let somebody else manage the money. Now you're going to be a much more active stakeholder and you're going to do it through the process of you know using your funds uh, to vote, kind of like what we talked about in the DAO podcast. So I don't have all of the details. I actually need to go back and reread this paper, but this is kind of the first step in what I see as a series of, um, you know, really revolutions in how the world self-organizes, how people join together to create big working, big projects, how people come together to build new things. Um, now you have the true ability for your everyday person, your Main Street person, to join together with a million other Main Street people and fund some projects that you know, maybe a VC wouldn't have funded before, maybe even the government wouldn't have given a, a grant to someone before because they thought it was too risky. Now you have the ability to sort of democratize funding as well as governance. So there's a lot there. Happy to kick it over to you, James. Yeah, but go ahead. It's, it's really fascinating because, you know, as I'm sitting here thinking, I'm thinking, okay, like what is, it wasn't, let's say a blow up of a DAO, but, you know, Constitution DAO was, it was successful, but also highly unsuccessful at the same time. Yeah. Yeah. It was, it, it, yeah, it was an absolute mess. After, like, it, it was a great idea. And if it would have been pulled off before Ken Griffin hit the top, the highest bid, it would have been great because 
well, I think it still would have been a mess because people thought they were actually getting ownership of the, the constitution. But in reality, the Dow was just buying it and then going to have it going to have it be shown somewhere because you can't really just like have a constitution in your house. I don't think people would necessarily allow that. It has to like sit somewhere. Um, hey. But, you know, when when. Good. And for, for those of you who don't know what Constitution DAO was, basically this, this group of people got together, a bunch of Ethereum stakeholders, and they said, we're going to buy one of the original copies of the, I think it was the Constitution. Yeah, and, Constitution. you know, they Which got together sick. like, yeah, it's crazy. Um, the, what they were trying to do, though, was buy the rights. They were basically trying to buy the Constitution, but then they would have the ability to vote on where that Constitution would be housed if yeah. they had one. They raised $40 million, but I think a hedge fund manager, Ken Griffin, raised 43 so they lost out. And in the process of losing out, they had to try to figure out logistics for returning everyone's Ethereum. Mm -hmm. And because of gas fees and stuff, you know, it wasn't really economically feasible. So, sorry, I didn't yeah. mean to interrupt. Just no, no, to... I, I appreciate the clarification because uh, it's just crazy to think about because, you know, they say in the beginning, like when they were talking about it, like, hey, like, don't see this as an investment. This is literally like, this is fun. And yeah. that's what it was. It was fun. It was a way, it was a power grab. It was like, you know, old school finance versus new school DeFi. Um, yeah. because Ken Griffin is a titan. He's a titan in the hedge fund world. You know, Citadel, uh, across all their business units from Citadel Securities, Citadel, uh, like Wellington Fund and, and all the different things that they manage, they do very well. They actually had a great year last year. I uh, just saw their performance. But, you know, it, it was interesting to see how quickly people came together. And it sucks to see when things don't go right and it gets messy. But one of the things I love about, you know, the crypto community and the decentralized community is people come up with fixes very, very quickly to problems because it's not one organization's job to come up with a fix. So you're not sitting at you know a uh, you know a legacy monolith tech company trying to come up with a solution to you know a very difficult problem. Like we'll see that solution 20 years from now after you know there's been 50 meetings about it of just planning it and then going there. You know the the system moves and they move quickly. And the good thing about it is they get proposals done and then they start working on the proposals and then it goes from there. It's, it's a much more like fluid community. And that's where it gets like really interesting. And this to me sounds, you know, in a way like a solution to something along those lines where, you know, and maybe it wasn't a solution to that specific problem. But one thing that that problem showed is that this would be a problem in the future or it could be a yeah. problem in the future, especially as DAOs, which is, is probably one of the most exciting parts of the decentralized ecosystem continues to grow. Um, which is, it's fascinating. And again, it's always nice to see, you know, the, uh, the decentralized world doing what they do best. And, you know, everyone says like, thank God for the internet, like, thank God for, you know, web three now, like, cause you know, web two, the internet is, it's no longer, <laughs> no longer is exciting. <laughs> um, which it, it, it's really fascinating and DAOs and in a way it's, you know, you're now looking at, uh, you know, decentralized investment committee. Because a yeah. lot of big institutional investors, they have an investment committee, something comes along, everyone has to look at it, but it's really just 10 people, depending on how big the organization is, looking at whatever due diligence was done. You know, this could, in theory, be thousands of people voting on, you know, these types of things. In a way, it's the, uh, and it kind of just, you know, maybe I'm a little far out there now making connections, but, you know, one of the things we've seen in the past two years is like the rise of the day trader, you know, the Robin Hood mafia, the, Red, the Wall Street bets mafia. But, you know, people have made some money um, and, and that's a fact, but also, you know, things are just changing. You don't have to be an institutional investor anymore just to, to get that edge. You know, a lot of times, like there are a lot of resources out there that you can get access to information. Yeah, you don't have the millions of dollars to pay for alternative data sets and, you know, very accurate and up to like real time data, but you're able to make investment decisions for the majority of that. And this could just be a further of that, you know, that trend, that further fueling of that fire, fanning that fire. To continue to grow and, and in a way, you know, maybe this is a way to get around the accredited investor rule too. Um, because it's yeah, you know, I, yeah, and, and this has all been around forever, like crowdfunding. This isn't something new. There's Indigo, um, you know, GoFundMe, all these different things. Like this has existed. It's just making it better in a way and cutting out the middle person. Now you don't have to say, let me let me tip 10% to GoFundMe to keep their ongoing operations. No, this should be free. And not free. Like I've already gave you money. Like I don't need your website for anything because in a DAO, there is no need for, or like anything along those lines. Send the funds. That's it. It's done. It's on the blockchain. You paid your gas fees. I'll pay a transaction fee. I'm not giving you a tip. You know, 
I, I see a lot of potential in this world, like just the world of decentralized decentralization, obviously, but also the world of DAOs. I just, if, you know, if we really, I'm a sci-fi geek. So really, if we move to a world where, you know, the sci-fi dream of a utopia in the future holds true, where, you know, humans are just self-organizing and money is not a, a huge issue anymore, I think DAOs are going to be a, a, play a big role because you can see the power of what, what humans can accomplish when they come together. It's just that money is usually the, you know, the blocker. And so now if you have a way for large groups of people, you know, population keeps growing. And if you have a way for a large group of people to come together to achieve a common goal, um, where they're incentivized to do so, I think, the, I think that could change the world. So I'm really excited about DAOs, clearly. I agree I think, with you. Yeah, I just have this idea in my head about how they're going to change the world. I, I suspect one day I'll probably start working on something <laughs> DAO related. Uh, it's interesting because if you think about it, like, and this is this is definitely far out there. Like, you know, probability-wise, it's very unlikely that with only you know living, you know, intelligent life forms in the universe. Like, once we figure that out, like, do countries matter? Do borders matter? Oh, yeah. Like, when we're when we're really like, we truly all are the same because like we're going to be very different than you know some something else or whatever else is out there. And like, if you think about you know, if I were to, you know, there's no way to predict any of this stuff because it's all you know, based on whatever an imagination in a way, but you, you almost imagine that it would have to be some type of DAO yeah. that would be kind of bringing the world together, especially in like a crisis where like, let's say there's a huge, you know, food crisis, energy crisis, eventually like if there's a reason for borders to be taken down, that was the only way to be able to, you know, kind of organize and, and you know, in a way it's way too complicated right now to be able to manage everything from a DAO. But I think in the future, as people get a better handle of it, I don't really see the need for government. You know, I could see a world where you've got different DAOs for different purposes. Like you've yeah. got maybe a solar power sharing DAO where you've got you've got solar panels that are producing too much energy, so you sell them to other people, or uh, you know, you use a DAO to exchange those. Or maybe you've got a solar, maybe you've got a DAO to handle loading, you know, across different locales. But I agree with you. I think that again, I'm kind of the utopian. Uh, let's say five thousand years from now, are we going to have governments? Are we going to have borders? I don't know, maybe. I mean, we've had them for a long time, but, you know, the world is becoming more and more global. People are becoming more and more sort of uh, interconnected. This, I think if you're a crypto enthusiast, you probably believe that there's going to be some sort of digital currency that takes over as the world's economy. So why would you need currency? Why would you need borders and countries? Like, hey, I love, I love the US. It's given my family a ton of opportunities, but at the same time, I'm also a citizen of the world. I don't know, you know, maybe we're not going to see it in our lifetimes, but I can see it happening. And I think that decentralized sort of economies and decentralization is a it's the way forward for us. And the cool part about that is, you know, especially in this, I guess, is any online game in a way. Um, and maybe this kind of segues into a couple of the other things we're going to talk about. But I love playing video games with people like on the other side of the world because like we'll be playing the same game and there's nothing better when it's like someone's up super early, you know, playing games yeah. and it's like super late my time and we're just like hanging out and playing. But, you know, one of the things that has really caught you know, my, one of the things I love about it is, you know, it doesn't matter where I, I'm in the United States, everyone in the Philippines is same access to yeah. those, those blockchain type investments. And that, in my opinion, is how the world should be. If you have the money, great. And we're human beings. Like, we should understand the risk. If you, can, if you do something that was too risky, you can't cry wolf after it or, you know, cry about it and ask for, you know, regulations. Like, I don't need more regulations. I understand when I put my money in something, I could lose it all. And it's up to me to do my due diligence. And that's really, that's, that's what decentralization is, blockchain is. It's kind of, you know, play at your own risk, which is fine for me, as long as you know what you're doing. But I've also, I've made mistakes. I've, I've, uh, I remember I, I sent too much polka dot to someone and they sweep every account that has less than one polka dot token. So I just like lost like 0.75. It's not a huge amount of money, but you imagine that was Ethereum. And you lost 0.75 ether, like that's an issue. Yeah. Or even worse, like Bitcoin. Bitcoin. Like you, yeah. you lose 0.75 Bitcoin. I would I'd be a very unhappy person. Um, but you know, over the break, I, I was I was doing a lot more digging into NFTs just because it, it is fascinating. You think about uh I, I was watching a couple of things, the Nike acquisition of the NFT studio. You know, everyone knew Nike was starting to get into NFTs, they patented like virtual shoe or decentralized shoe or something. But it, it one of the things that you know, I was really interested about is I knew that, you know, Disney was getting into NFTs and they were doing some, you know, work with Vivi. And I, I just remembered it out of nowhere. I downloaded the app and I look at it. They, it is very popular, right? The floor value of these NFTs already in the thousands. 
And these are things like the Mickey Mouse statue. But one of the areas that I think is, is absolutely genius is they're releasing all the comics. Um, and they're keeping that same level of rarity. So eventually, you know, that, that first edition, I think Spider-Man, or one of the most like, expensive comics that exists, that'll come out as an NFT. That goes for millions of dollars. I wonder what that NFT goes for. You know what I mean? Like, does it go for the same value? Uh, Because it all comes down to scarcity. And, like, that's where comics, the the older it is, the likely the more scarce it is. And that's why it's more valuable. There's less uh, supply and there's a lot of demand. The good thing about NFTs is you can keep that scarcity uh, and you just sell it. And the cool thing, you know, I think about it from Disney's perspective, and I didn't look at anything from there is, you know, they get in a 5% rip anytime someone sells that. I bet you they are if they can be. Because I know Adidas or Pepsi did a big NFT launch. They didn't do anything. Like they made no money from it. It was this thing. And these things are selling for a lot of money. And you think about it, like, one, that's a lost business opportunity, in my opinion. But like the world is changing. It's changing fast. And it's the point where, you know, last time, last cycle, you know, people are like, oh, this is overheating. Oh, this is overheating. But you like kind of yeah. saw the signs of a bubble. Like, yeah, like people are really interested in NFTs. But there's still a lot of demand for it. And you're now seeing like things that you would expect to have a lot of value, have a lot of value. You know, no one's buying a million dollar rock anymore. You know, people are buying, you know, yeah. million dollar custom NFTs that are like beautiful and these things like that. And it's just game changing. And they, like a, a brand like Disney, who like you can argue no one has more brand value than Disney over you know, 100 years. Maybe Apple has more brand value now, but Disney is probably one of the most well-known brands across the world. You know, that's a, and and they're also, it's not like they're old, like they're still pumping out Marvel movies. They're so, pump- yeah. there's so many opportunities for them to make money. And you think about it, that's a, di- that's, I'm going to buy Disney stock. I just talked myself into buying Disney stock. <laughs> uh, I'm going to do that tomorrow. But that's, it. but the thing is, is, you know, it, it's nice to see some of these, you know, more archaic companies in a nice way, uh, in the nice way possible, start to like change. And Disney, that's, you know, it's even more interesting because that's like, a, that's an old, old company. But like even like companies like Nike, like getting into this, like making the plunge, you know, before other brands did. And in the metaverse, like it, it's already happening. Like I, I was looking at sales for Oculus through the roof during mm. the holiday season, like through the wow. roof. It was like the top, like one of the top trending products, like searches are up, like through the roof. You see all these videos of people getting them. Like it's already starting. Um, and it's already, it's because they're more affordable now too. I think it's like 199 or 299 now oh, that's to get great. like one of the Oculus Quest. I remember we were talking with someone back in, I don't remember who we were talking to. We were on a call together and they were saying how they had a meeting in, uh, in the metaverse, in Oculus. And this was like two years ago. That's and I'm thinking hilarious. About, wow. And I'm thinking about it, like, wow, like what, like what movers? And they're like, obviously all techies and they're all like yep. engineers and they're like loving it. I think they, they were playing, oh, they met in Skyrim uh or so, like one of those games and they're just like chatting around a fire but if you think about it like yeah you'll you'll get like the sales people and you know oh, i'll never do any of this like bs like if everything moves to that you're going to move to it too and this whole like oh that's never going to happen i i kind of disagree now like that's the it's the next phase like who it's the same thing like did people think we we're going to have computers in our pockets 15 years ago i don't think so like i just maybe not 50, 20 years ago, like in 2000, 2000, did people think we'd have a, a computer accessible in our pocket at any time? I, I don't think so. No. There would have been like yeah. pocketcomputer.com, Palm Pilot. Uh, there you go. For, for all those who, who ne- remember Good the Good old Palm computer. Pilot. Man, throwback. But yeah, and, and the thing is, is it's, uh, the world is changing and the world is changing fast, but it's also changing quietly. Because you haven't, you know, you see it everywhere, but like, how is Disney that far under the radar with how well their NFTs are doing? Because I bet you it probably started out as a beta and now it's like, oh God. Sure. Yeah. We have a, we have a $2,000 floor value on our, uh, on our NFT. Like there's like a Superman NFT because VD does a lot with, I think DC as well. There's like a Superman NFT that had like a 2K floor value. And it was, uh-huh. it was really interesting. And um, and then I download the app. I turned on the Twitter notifications, the Discord notifications, and I want to get on the next drop. Uh, and this, and the interesting thing is, this isn't Ethereum either. I don't, I don't think VV is built on Ethereum. It's like its own like blockchain. Mm. And uh, I was talking to Shanif a little bit about this before, but Ethereum's got to make some changes before these uh, these gas fees. I mean, make it 
turn it not extinct because there's already there's always going to be things on Ethereum that'll always be there, but it's not going to have access to that same user base if it can't figure out a scale. And gas fees just it makes it infeasible right now. Ether Ethereum 2.0 at some point in 2022, I think <laughs> that's what that's what they're saying. Who knows? Yeah. Let's see. I th so the thing is, is <clears throat> excuse me. Oh, so, right there? you know, the, uh, yeah, no, no, I am good. Um, but the, the big thing that the reason why I love like Polkadot is like, not because it's going to replace Ethereum. It, it doesn't, in, in theory, it doesn't really even compete with Ethereum because there's already uh, integrations being built for Ethereum. It's actually going to allow different blockchains to bridge over to Polkadot and be able to communicate with each other. So you can pour it over Ethereum. You can pour it over something sitting in, you know, Solana, whatever it is. You know, as long as they're using uh, what is it, WebAssembly, or it's WebAssembly compatible, they they should be able to. I read into it. you. Would, I'm trying to talk about technical terms in here as a salesperson, <laughs> but it's uh, that's like the future. Is everything being interconnected? Because you know, Ethereum being its own data silo, like think about it. That's like what every big organization is trying to get rid of today. That's like the the crux of digital transformation is let's get rid of data silos. So how do you do that? You know, you integrate with more other chains because. Right now, we already know Ethereum doesn't fit every use case. It's too expensive for small transactions, um, which, which cuts out a bunch of investors, primarily a lot of investors overseas. Um, and that's why I think BNB is so big mm. you know, in Southeast Asia uh, and you know, different areas there. But the world's changing. And you know, Ashneef's heard me talk about Polkadot to, you know, for years now. But the fact that T, uh, or the parent company of T-Mobile, Deutsche uh, Telekom, they're going to be a validator node on Polkadot. They're not just, you know, let's say integrating the payments like most other, you know, blockchain projects like Bitcoin, Bitcoin Cash, and Dogecoin like Tesla. Like this is someone investing in the infrastructure of Polkadot and saying that they want to be a validator to help keep the network secure for decentralized communication. I don't know about you, and, and this is a question I've been asking everyone because I want someone to prove me wrong, but I haven't seen this any with any other project. Maybe the Avalanche and the Deloitte thing, but that was Deloitte recommended they use Avalanche. Like they they had to have found Polkadot. You know, like it's it's kind of the way I'm thinking about it. And even then, like like uh, just something like a, a company of that size, a public company of that size, that's it's a big deal. Or at least it is to me. And maybe I'm like reading between the lines, like, or maybe I'm missing something, but that's like game changing. Like that is, that's like, you know, the first big company to like say, oh, we have email now. I think it's, it's, it's impressive. I mean, you are, you know, you've kind of gotten me into Polkadot. I know so they, I gotta, started... they should hire me or something. <laughs> they probably should actually. You're a good spokesperson. Um, you know, I, I don't know what corporates corporates are out there and what they're partnering with, but I know that you're excited about this and I know you've been right uh, a lot. And you know, when I'm like, oh, what's James talking about? I don't know what this is. And then like three months later, you come out to be totally right. I'm like, okay, James is a genius. Like I know that you're excited. And so that's why I'm excited. But I, yeah. I think that, uh, you know, whatever they're doing is interesting. Uh, I don't know much about it at this point, but yeah. it's something maybe we could look into and do a you know I, a mini podcast on at some point. I I was going to write an or I was going to write a blog post about just that thing because I was Perfect. I was reading I was just like so excited about because I and I wanted to like answer that question for myself and like really research it and like look through it, but there's and the reason why I kind of tie this back in and the reason why I brought it up is you know it's not just T-Mobile's innovation arm. We now have Nike. We have Adidas, we have Disney. That's three of the largest consumer brands that exist. And that means that they're not going to be the only ones that do it because anyone who doesn't do it, you're going to get left behind because one, it, it's just revenue that's going to be out there. And also with all these privacy changes that are happening with you know the iOS update, now email tracking not being allowed. Yeah. I think there's an opportunity to build like a, you know, a loyalty program in a way through NFTs, because mm -hmm. then it goes into a lot of the privacy and digital infrastructure that's being created, like New Cipher on Ethereum. Um, we actually just finished up that merger, by the way. They merged with Keep Network, and it was the first decentralized merger of networks. And now it is uh -huh. the Threshold Network, and they're going to have the first decentralized, like truly decentralized uh, Bitcoin, TBTC. Uh -huh. 
because there's going to be no intermediary. Because I, I haven't looked too much. I haven't brought my BTC into Ethereum or anything. Um, so, but apparently it's not truly decentralized. There's someone who like takes custody of it or something along those lines. I, I don't really know much about it because in my eyes, when I first got into it, there were two separate like entities. Um, but like, if you're able, like, there's data breaches everywhere, but a lot of these privacy solutions are like for the ability to not have to like share a lot of information, but still be able to validate transactions. Like I know that doesn't solve the loyalty program aspect of it, but there's gotta be a way to know who some of your best customers are without knowing who your best customers are and be able to target them in some way, shape or form. Cause in a way that's, that's kind of how ads work. You know, I've I've kind of cut my teeth in the world of ads and marketing, and I can't. I there's got there's going to be some sort of company out there or multiple companies that do advertising on the blockchain. And I guarantee you, they're going to be someone who's going to figure it out. I hope that doesn't happen in the next ten years because, gosh, that sucks. Like ads on the blockchain, but it's going to happen. Sorry, a <laughs> little bit of an aside. You think I, so? I I almost think like I. So many people hate ads these days. Like every engineer I know hates ads. They're trying to put every like ad blocker they can. You know, a guy I used to work with, like I, I'm almost positively coded up his own ad blocker so that nothing wow. could get through. Um, but at the same time, there's other ways to compensate people for their time. And you know, the reason why ads exist is because they're using free services. So they're getting that service in return. But it, hypothetically, you know, they can be compensated directly by a brand for that access and it's you ask someone true. do you it could it'd probably be a minimal amount of money but it's something for showing an advertisement personally i wouldn't i wouldn't care to be paid to be like i'm gonna buy things either way like make sure and the thing is if i know that the data collection process is like lights out and that it will be hyper personalized and there's even some like ai projects going on like ocean protocol which it's really interesting but they can like share information uh, without actually sharing the information to be used to train AI models. So like, I don't know how that works, but like I read an article about it. I was like, wow, that sounds like a problem that I know exists because no one wants to let anything out of their walled garden, mm. but if it's safe and people can, you know, in a way you can team up with other companies to share data and share, you know, all of this to be able to train models. Like that's pretty fascinating. It's interesting. As an, as a data scientist, I'm, Curious, You're skeptical, and I'm, skeptical, and do not believe that it's possible. But I, I actually think well, this it's a it's a common paradigm. You you obfuscate data before you turn it into a model, and then when you go to predict, you obfuscate the data. So I don't know how they're doing it, but I can think of probably ways to do it. Uh, but this is very like I'm an AI guy, so like that's very I, hitting me close to home. So I'm very curious to yeah, see how like, that works. I just. I read it was just like completely trustless. And I was like, okay. Like, and if you think about it, think about like all these, a big thing that's popped up is like the Snowflake data exchange, like all these different data marketplaces mm -hmm. that exist to sell like data. Uh, okay. And you think about it, uh, like DuckDuck, uh, not DuckDuckGo, Brave, Brave, the browser. Um, but that's the whole point is to have like, well, DuckDuckGo is more secure, but like Brave is really to, you know, so you own your data. Um, and like, you're getting compensated yeah. for, I think that data or like, to get ads, there's some compensation structure. Reminds me of when we talked about stacks or, or block stack, uh, which it used to be called, very similar in terms of- Someone brought you know. that up recently to me and I was like- Oh, really? That was the first thing. And <laughs> she's she's actually, it's someone that I like really, really respect. Like I wouldn't be surprised if she is like friends with Satoshi. Like she was telling everyone uh -huh. to get into Bitcoin like in the beginning and like, and hounded it. And, but she was talking about how like the most recent update, um, the taproot upgrade. Now there's a smart contract functionality, and that and that's really that could be really big for Bitcoin because if you think about that, like Bitcoin is the highest, but it has the most money. Most people own Bitcoin. Like yeah. you can start using Bitcoin as like legit collateral for real world assets. Like could you like why put a down payment on a home if you could put down payment in Bitcoin? Like I put I would put my down payment in Bitcoin and paying cash. Like if I knew that I could get a better rate, if it was securitized by something. Very interesting. That's just, that's just me. Sounds sounds like that's a good transition to talk about DeFi. But DeFi. I'll leave yeah. it to you. Yeah. So DeFi, DeFi is really interesting. You know, a lot of the DeFi, uh, DeFi tokens have been pumping recently. And I think it's a lot to do with the, the changes in that most recent uh, 
the whatever the bill that was passed where there's all the crypto stuff like packed into it because it completely related to the bill about build america better yeah. act um it had nothing to do with it but they needed to get through the regulations and i think they were eased a little bit which maybe was like a tailwind for a lot of the folks that were worried about kyc um kyc is inevitable in my opinion like you can't there's no way that we're not going to have it just because you're going to hear the same things over and over again terrorism, money laundering, you know, all these different things. It's going to happen. And, you know, it is what it is. But I still think DeFi is going to be the foundation um, for this, like, next generation of, like, financial applications. Like, it's going to move so quickly. And I'm super excited. I got the Voyager debit card. It is a USDC-backed debit card where, like, you spend money and it converts to cash. That's it. And you earn 9% interest. So I... It's too. It sounds too good to be true. It's probably going to be too good to be true. But you know, I'm gonna I'm gonna check it out for as long as I can. But that's that's like really interesting as well because even just having having that money not be in like let's say just straight cash, like you can send that and it could be somewhere same day immediately because USDC is the same settlement as any other blockchain based tool. So I could take that right after my paycheck. It's immediately available at USDC. I can send that immediately to Coinbase and I can immediately trade it versus having to wait. You know, God knows how long for it to settle. So that's like really interesting in and of itself. And then that starts to change, you know, the game, if that starts to become the norm. And if you look at, I've been looking at job listings for like the JP Morgans, the Goldman's of the world. They haven't just been hiring for like blockchain experience. Like they're like, they've been like really heavy hiring for like actual like engineers and stuff. So I imagine those aren't going to be the first, that's not going to be the, the it'll be the first, I guess, because I haven't seen it anywhere else. Um, actually BlockFi probably has something at this point. But it definitely won't be the last. Um, so, I, you know, I know you're doing some work in, you know, yeah. a little bit of work yeah. in DeFi. Uh, what are you most you, excited about for in the new year? I think there's an interesting application. You know, we had talked about yield farming um, mm-hmm. a few podcasts ago. And I can see a world where your everyday person, you, me, whoever, uh, has a bunch of coins. And they use a service that automatically moves those coins around to the highest yielding service or coin or network at any given time. So I'm really interested. You know, I have um, I have been looking personally for an alternative to like stocks and crypto, something that can provide steady cash flow. And there's just not much out there. Right. And so you can imagine a world where DeFi and different DeFi services open up a world where you can get, you know, eight to 10 percent APR or APY. Um, by just holding your coins. Now, what's what's the hassle today? The hassle today is you have to go and research which networks are going to be yielding the most, and then you have to trust those networks. Sometimes you've got this jank coin that's paying like 50%, but then it crashes to zero. So you're going to have to have some sort of automated system. Um, so if you believe that people are going to want to do yield farming and they're going to want to optimize their yields across their coins, you probably are going to need some sort of automatic system that does all this for you. So I've actually looked into seeing if, you know, if we could, if it's easy to build a, an MVP for something like that. Um, Solana, which I started with, provides their API provides a, a little bit of an ability to calculate sort of the interest rates for your for your address, but the tooling's not quite there yet. And then I looked into all of these other blockchains to see if uh, it was easy to figure out the APY where. You know, if you know it, you can then start to build a bot to, to optimize it, but couldn't find really anything. So I think the tooling is not quite there yet, especially from the developer perspective. But I see a world, maybe not this year, maybe not even next year, but in the near future, where you've got these services that are optimizing all of your coin holdings for you and basically getting you a real interest rate that you cannot get from the dollar or bonds or, you know, even even uh, interest adjusted bonds like uh, what the treasury the trip the, you know I I don't yeah, see tips. the real yeah. you know yeah tips I don't see the traditional fiat world producing high yielding assets anymore so maybe no, crypto but, takes you, over. We think about it like one of a like big like one of a, a big asset class like institutions is like uh, like cash backed assets like um, you know like brokerage bonds and you know uh, like just pretty much any asset backed security. Uh, we all know what asset-backed securities are because they are what crashed the financial system in 2008. But at the same time, DeFi can make that more efficient, uh, as well as then you know it would open up more doors because you know if you are just looking for capital and you don't really care what that capital comes from, it can come from 
you know, a hedge fund. They could come from, you know, James is, you know, sitting and, um, you know, at his desk and he's looking for a high yielding investment. You can up those, you, it can become crowdfunding. Yeah. And, you know, I'd love to get my hands on some of those. It'd probably drive down rates because so many people would look for it because that's an asset class that's very hard to get into because they're huge, huge ticket items. Like, you're like, and no one, and you can't just go and buy it. It's, I guess in a way it could be like a structured note, but it, it's very, it, it's very, very interesting because what I'm excited about in 2022 is I think we'll start seeing more of a, more intersection between like the traditional world and like the services that we're used to and like the, the blockchain, the centralized world. You know, we've already seen it with DeFi and investments. That was just, it was just the beginning. Now we're seeing it with NFTs and, you know, all this different. And then we're getting new solutions like privacy and uh, digital infrastructure layers built onto these blockchains. You know, one of the, there is, I've been investing in Cypher for a while and a privacy layer on top of Ethereum, but the privacy layer that's going to launch on Polkadot raised like $20 million from investors, or I think it might invest uh, or raise more. Like this is an area that'll be interesting. And if, if one thing is for certain, there's been enough data breaches with Web2 and, you know, all that here for, for all of this to exist, to work and be successful, there's got to be a lot of data protections because I, in a way it kind of, it's a fully transparent ecosystem where you can see anything, but that's not always good if you could see everyone doing everything. Uh, it's not really, yeah. that's not, it's not something because eventually, yeah, you can like you can say it's anonymized because it doesn't have their name, but like you're going to be able to, this whole thing, like you don't, anonymized data doesn't exist almost. Like you can always figure out who that person is if you really wanted to with anonymized data sets. I was reading this uh, this thread on Reddit and people were like, you should not use blockchain for voting because it's less anonymous and it's mm -hmm. uh, less sort of uh, efficient than the voting system we have today. And I kind of agree, right? Like you can always 100%. take someone's, public key and you can steal their private like if you're really really good and really want to do it you can find their private key and you can tie back a vote to who you know if you use the blockchain for voting you can tie back a vote to who voted uh today you can't really do it that easily so i still i agree with you there's a couple of things you're going to need to change in the privacy area and the anonymization area in order to make these applications useful for certain use cases uh i think it could happen if if the world wanted to move that direction um, but you're right. There's some applications today where it's not going to be useful. Um, who knows what one, in the future? I think one thing's for sure is I think trust for like just institutions, like, and I'm not talking about like financial institutions. I'm just thinking about like institutions in general. Um, it, it's probably at an all time low. I couldn't imagine it being uh, lower yeah. where, you know, I don't even, people don't even follow politics anymore because I don't care. It's like, it's such a, non it's a non-factor because like nothing changes year in and year out everything has been the same for as long as i can remember now i was i look back on i'm not even i'm not even old but i think about like the stuff we're talking about today was the same things people were talking about like 15 years ago like nothing changes and there's a lot of things like age limits on senators who like don't even know what a blockchain is they probably think it's like one of those uh like building blocks with like a chain on it or something that you like connect to others and like build a lego set but like oh, um, <laughs> yeah it was i was watching one of the the it was like someone it was one of the senators was talking to mark zuckerberg during like one of the hearings he was like uh yeah face gram and he, everyone was like what and he, he like actually thought it was face gram like he just merged Gosh. facebook and instagram like and that's like when you see something like that you're like okay like that's embarrassing like how like, this is yeah so that well i hope that changes and, and it seems to be it seems like there's like been a good like group of senators that have really like spearheaded this because they do like if you think about it, if you're if you're all into like the u.s continuing to be like the power that we are and continue to be like one of the top countries in the world if you shun decentralized infrastructure you shun the blockchain you shove web3 we won't be one of those power like i 100%. do think this is i think totally it's game changing agree. and that's what a lot of them are saying is like you are you are turning away the next big, like this is the, we are in the midst and we're having a lot of industrial revolutions now because some people say the cloud was the last one, but this is already, I, I think this eclipsed the cloud. Like the cloud needed to be for this to exist because in a way this is a decentralized cloud, I guess. Yeah. Because the data yeah. is still, yeah. Especially if you can, I think there's a couple of blockchains that are trying to do this, but if you can start running applications on a blockchain, mm -hmm. it's decentralized cloud right there. 
And so, I know uh, there's been a handful of outages over the past couple of weeks that have, have been pretty bad from what I can tell from folks that I know have been dealing with them. Um, and it seems like these outages are happening more and more and more. And it's, huh. uh, it's, it's interesting. I don't know. You, you hear more about this, but, um, but yeah, so it, I think, you know, not to, uh, to kind of ramble too much here into the end. Uh, I'm just excited for 2022. I don't think we're, you know, heading into, you know, I was looking at, well, one, I hope not because ultimately I, I want to continue growing, but I, I think we're, you know, that the last bull cycle, we had that big run up and then, you know, kind of crashed a little bit. Then we shot even higher, like way higher yep. than that. Like, I think that's kind of where we're at because it's not like oh, everyone's, man. everyone is scared right now. It's not, it's not, I, like, no one is bullish right now. Like you, you talk to people like, Oh, like, you know, Bitcoin's down, but you know, people are still buying. Like it's, it's interesting. Cause if like, you look at any, like the, the fear greed indexes, they're at like all time fear. But then you're thinking about like, really? is it really man. that fear? Because like I'm buying it whenever I can. Dude, I remember right after the peak of, I think what was it? 2018. Mm-hmm. The, you know, Bitcoin went from like 19,000 to like 15,000 in one day. Then it dropped to like 12 and then it went all the way down to three. And I remember people were f- freaked out. It feels different this time around. That felt yeah. diff- That felt much more intense than the, it was the today. Three, the, three was, the three was different though, because that three hit in March, 2020. And that three was due to a liquidity crisis because everyone was getting hit with margin calls on equities. And you had to pull that money from somewhere when the market like tanks 30%. I, I feel like that was like, you know, ultimately people were selling. But that was like an artificial sell. Like it was a it was a need to happen to ultimately yeah. like meet that like liquidity. But who knows? But regardless, it does not feel good going from twenty to three. I I bought some Bitcoin at fifty. That goes to three. I'll be very very upset with that. Um, and I'm sure a lot of people will. But I just I don't see it anymore. It, it, I don't see it. It's different. It's it feels different this time around. It feels different now. Maybe maybe we're wrong. Yeah, you're right. Like micro strategy buying things. Would be, would be done. MicroStrategy wouldn't like they wouldn't exist anymore because they like I don't even know what they do anymore. Like they're no longer an <laughs> analytics company, uh, or maybe they are still. But then like what would happen to Coinbase? Like that's a public company too. So like there's all these things that you know there's a lot of intertwining. And then you have countries that are doing things with blockchain it's, or Bitcoin. And if uh, it, and I think there's going to be more countries that adopt it as well. I think it's just I think so. I think uh, so. I, I think so. El Salvador was a pioneer. I give them lots of props. I can't yeah. wait. I mean, I, I guarantee there's going to be a couple more at least in the next couple of years, if not a lot more. I hope they really do like uh, have the ability to harness all like that volcanic energy, because then you look at other countries in South America, like Chile, Argentina, like if they can har- harness that as well, why, why wouldn't they be the mining capital of the world? Because that's some of the best energy, the cleanest and best energy you can get. And it's very abundant in those areas. Yeah. It's just... Yeah it's not helpful in like normal society because like it's in the middle of nowhere. So like, you can't like bring that back to towns, but you can build huge ass mining like infrastructure there. Cause why not? Um, and a lot of that'll be automated eventually like in the future, but you know, not to bore everyone, um, which I don't think we ever do, but I think we will be talking a lot about and predictions for 2022. We'll be talking a lot about DAOs this year, talking a lot about NFTs and, uh, I think we would talk a lot about scaling. It's yeah, going to I, I was like going to say big thing. If I had to choose the three, I, I would pick those three. And I think scaling and sort of all the stuff that goes around it is going to be a big theme for this year as well. So we'll see. We'll see. But as always, everyone, please make sure you subscribe to our podcast on Spotify, Apple Music, YouTube. Sign up to our newsletter, and please let us know what you want to talk about. You know, we're always uh, love feedback always want to do better, um, always want to improve. Uh, But we're happy to dive into any subject. And, you know, otherwise, we're going to keep hitting with the the things that we find interesting, which is a lot, luckily. And tell tell your friends about us, too. Like, if you (laughs) like what you guys are hearing, you know, spread the word, because we're just a couple of guys in a couple of basements right now. So, you know, (laughs) help us, you know, help us make something big and help us grow. And if you guys like it, then, you know, maybe, you know, who knows what happens. So, yeah, Yeah. spread the word. Share it, forward it, tell your friends. If anyone wants to come on the podcast, let us know. We're always looking for new faces, new ideas. Um, Otherwise, you know, as always, uh, hope you enjoy your week. Super excited to to talk with you all next week. And, you know, Shneef, anything before we let everyone go? No, I think you got it. Happy New Year, everybody. And I think that we're all excited. Happy New Year. Uh, Let's see what 2022 brings. The year of blockchain. Absolutely.
Awesome. Thanks, James. I'll talk to you next yeah. time. Talk to you See next you guys. time. Chief.